In this lecture, we will introduce the absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature. In the previous lecture, we've seen that all reversible heat engines which exchange heat only at two temperatures, theta 1 and theta 2, have equal efficiencies. That means the efficiency that is 1 minus the heat that is rejected Q2 over the heat that is absorbed that is Q1 is a function of the temperatures theta1 and theta2 of the source and the sink. In other words, we have seen that Q1 by Q2 is a function of theta1 and theta2 only. Now using this equation, we'll introduce the absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature. So as a first step, what we are going to do is that we are going to show that this function f of theta1 and theta2 has a property that f of theta1 comma theta2 is equal to f of theta1 comma theta0 over f of theta2 comma theta0 where theta1 theta0 and theta2 are three arbitrary temperatures now to show this consider that we have two heat engines let's say e1 and e2 so the reversible engines E1 and E2 operate in a way that the engine E1 operates in a cycle and it absorbs heat Q1 from a thermal reservoir at temperature theta1 and it rejects heat Q0 to a thermal reservoir at temperature theta0 and in one cycle it does some amount of work and this is the work that is produced by this engine E1 let's call it as W1 similarly this engine E2 takes in heat Q0 at temperature theta0 and rejects heat Q2 at temperature theta2 now we can apply this particular equation first to individually these engines E1 and E2. So if we apply this equation to engine E1, what we have is so Q1 over Q0 that is the heat that is being absorbed divided by the heat that is being rejected is equal to some function of theta1 comma theta0. So this is this particular equation applied to this reversible heat engine. So this is for E1. So for E2, we can apply this equation as Q0 over Q2 is now a function of theta0 comma theta2. Next, what we do is that we consider this combined system. Now, note that this thermal reservoir at temperature theta naught, it is receiving heat Q naught from this engine E1, but this engine E2 is extracting the same amount of heat in one cycle from this thermal reservoir. Then if we look at this combined system of engines E1, this thermal reservoir and E2, then this combined system operates in a cycle and it receives heat Q1 at theta1 and rejects heat Q2 at temperature theta2. Therefore, we can write for this combined system, let's say E1 plus E2, we have Q1 over Q2 
is a function of theta 1 comma theta 2. Next, what we do is that we can eliminate q0 from these two equations. So we can multiply these two equations and what we get is q1 by q0 times q0 by q2 is equal to f of theta1 comma theta0 times f of theta0 comma theta2 and q0 cancels out and this is equal to q1 by q2 and from this equation we must have that this is equal to f of theta1 comma theta2 therefore we get this relation that f of theta1 and theta2 is f of theta1 comma theta0 times f of theta0 comma theta2 now what we do is that we can let's say equate theta1 and theta2 so what we'll have on the left hand side will be f of theta1 comma theta1 and note that from this equation if theta1 is equal to theta2 this would be equal to q1 over q1 and that would be equal to 1 so this is equal to 1 and if we look at this term now so we have f of theta1 comma theta0 and f of theta0 comma so theta2 is equal to theta1 so we can write that as theta1 so what we get from here is that f of theta0 comma theta1 is equal to 1 over f of theta1 comma theta0 now write this term as for using this particular relation so if we say instead of theta1 we and call this temperature as theta2 then this would be equal to f of theta1 comma theta0 and this term that is f of theta0 comma theta2 is 1 over f of theta2 comma theta0 therefore we have derived this relation that this function f of theta1 comma theta2 is equal to f of theta1 comma theta0 over f of theta2 comma theta0 and recall that this f of theta1 comma theta2 is the ratio of the heat that is absorbed by this reversible heat engine by the heat that is rejected by this reversible heat engine to a low temperature a thermal reservoir at temperature theta 2. Now because temperature theta naught in this discussion is arbitrary we can keep it constant in all our equations therefore we may consider this function f of theta 1 comma theta naught as a function of theta only so in general if we have a function f of theta comma theta naught because we can keep theta naught to be constant we can say that this is a function of theta only so we can call this function as k that is a constant times phi of theta therefore we can write this equation as q1 q2 is f of theta1 theta2 and this we have seen is equal to f of theta1 comma theta0 over f of theta2 
comma theta naught and we can write this as phi of theta 1 over phi of theta 2. So now note that we have used an arbitrary temperature scale theta in our discussion. So now what we can do is instead of using this arbitrary temperature scale theta, we can now associate an absolute thermodynamic temperature scale such that let's call this phi of theta as a new temperature scale and we'll call it as T. And this is the absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature. From this equation, we know that phi of theta is indeterminate up to a constant multiplicative factor. That means we are free to use the unit of this new temperature scale that is phi of theta in any way that is convenient to us. So this choice could be by assigning the difference between the boiling point and the freezing point of water at one atmosphere pressure as 100 degrees or let's say calling one degree as one over 273.16 of the temperature of the triple point of water and that we can call as one degree. So because this absolute scale is indeterminate because we have this constant k we can choose this constant in whatever way we like. Now if you recall when we looked at this temperature scale theta we said that this is the temperature scale that we get from the zero law. that means this is the temperature that can be measured in terms of the height of the mercury column in a mercury in a bulb thermometer or EMF difference across a thermocouple junction. Therefore, the temperature scale theta depends on the thermometric property of a substance. However, the absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature, that is this phi of theta, has an advantage that it is independent of the properties of any thermometric substance. Another advantage of this thermodynamic scale of temperature is that the laws of thermodynamics take on a simple form when the absolute temperature scale is used. So now that we have introduced this absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature, we shall show that the absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature coincides with the ideal gas temperature scale. Now before we do that, let us discuss in more detail as to how an ideal gas can be used to measure temperature. And this is done using gas thermometer. So let us look at this ideal gas temperature scale. And later on, we'll show that the absolute thermodynamic temperature scale coincides with this ideal gas temperature scale. So the ideal gas temperature scale is based on the observation that as the pressure of a real gas approaches zero, its equation of state approaches that of an idle gas. That is, the behavior of a real gas approaches to this equation of state as the pressure goes down. Now, to understand how an idle gas can be used to measure temperature, consider this constant volume gas thermometer. So a constant volume gas thermometer is shown in this figure over here. So this thermometer consists of a gas bulb in which a gas is filled. Then we have these tubes which are connected by a flexible tube so that the level of these tubes, this tube and this glass tube can be varied. Now this gas bulb is placed in thermal contact with a body whose temperature is to be measured. Because we want to keep the volume constant, so if let's say the temperature 
of the gas within the bulb increases then the gas is going to expand so to keep the volume constant we can change the level of this mercury column so that the mercury remains at this point a always so the pressure that is within the bulb so as to keep the volume constant is given by this length of the mercury column let's say l therefore the volume of the gas in the bulb remains constant and the pressure of the gas is indicated by the height of the mercury column that is l from this equation so volume is constant so the pressure that is given by this length of the mercury column indicates the temperature because this volume is constant and pressure will be proportional to temperature provided that the gas behaves as an idle gas so to measure temperature we do two sets of measurements so in the first measurement we measure the pressure that is associated with the triple point of water that is at 273.16 kelvin and this pressure that is measured by the length of this mercury column let's call this as ptp this corresponds to the triple point of water then we also measure the pressure let's say p of the gas when this gas bulb is in thermal contact with the body whose temperature we are going to measure and we call that as pressure p so if the gas behaves as an idle gas then from this equation what we get is let's say pressure p over the pressure at the triple point is equal to temperature t over 273.16 therefore the temperature of the body is given by 273.16 times pressure of the gas when the gas bulb is being used to measure temperature of the body of interest and ptp is the pressure corresponding to the temperature at the triple point of water so this is how one can measure temperature but this equation can be used only if we know that the gas behaves as an idle gas however practically no gas behaves as an idle gas therefore this equation cannot be used directly to measure the actual temperature of the body using the idle gas thermometer however we can use the fact that as the pressure approaches zero the behavior of all gases approaches that of an idle gas so what we do is that we make a series of measurements by varying the amount of gas in the gas bulb and we can let's say keep on reducing the amount of gas in the gas bulb so that the behavior of the gas approaches that of an idle gas and in each set of measurements we measure the pressure corresponding to the triple point of water and the pressure corresponding to the temperature measurement we want to make and from these two values we can measure let's say temperature t and let's call this as temperature ti assuming the gas to be an idle gas so then what we can do is that let's say we make a series of these measurements so we measure this indicated temperature ti assuming this equation is valid and we plot it versus the pressure at the triple point so let's say that you get some measurements because the pressure that is at triple point is going to vary when the amount of gas is different in this gas bulb then what we do is that we extrapolate this data 
to zero pressure and then we say that this is the actual temperature of the body this is because as we approach zero pressure all the gases will start behaving as an idle gas and for such a case this equation would certainly be valid but if we use different gases we are going to get different set of curves let's say we use another gas so this was let's say gas a and let's say we take another gas we may get a different curve but if we extrapolate this curve to zero pressure again we will get the same temperature and that's because all gases will behave as an idle gas as the pressure approaches zero so that is how temperature is measured using gas thermometer now note that using gas thermometer to measure temperature is laborious and requires a lot of precision therefore in practice we use the its 90 scale that we introduced during our discussion of the zeroth law so the its 90 scale is used in practice for temperature measurements which closely approximates the absolute thermodynamic temperature scale so now we are going to show that this ideal gas temperature scale coincides with this absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature now to show that the absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature coincides with the ideal gas temperature scale let's consider carnot cycle performed by an ideal gas so recall that we have this carnot cycle which we can depict on this p v diagram and we have state 1 so first we undergo isothermal expansion let's say at temperature t1 then we reach state 2 from state 2 to state 3 we go through a reversible adiabatic process then from state 3 to state 4 we reject heat let's say q2 and isothermally we go back to state 4 and then the gas undergoes reversible adiabatic compression and the gas goes back to state 1 so in the first step the heat that is absorbed at temperature t1 is q1 and during this step from 3 to 4 the system rejects heat q2 at temperature t2 so for simplicity we'll consider a unit mass of an idle gas so if we consider unit mass of an idle gas we want to first calculate the heat that is supplied to this gas within this process 1 to 2 so in this process if we apply the first law for unit mass of gas we get u2 minus u1 is equal to q let's say q12 that is the heat added during the process 1 to 2 and we have this work done on this system that is work 1 to 2 so for an isothermal process we know that for an idle gas the internal energy is a function of temperature only therefore this term is going to be zero therefore the heat that is added so q12 is equal to let's say this is heat q1 per unit mass is q1 so is equal to q1 and that is equal to minus of the work done on the system and this is equal to pdv and we'll integrate from v1 to v2 and we can use this relation that p 
is equal to RT over V because we are considering a Carnot cycle performed by an idle gas. So this equation would become R and temperature is T1 which is constant during this process. So the integral would be dV over V and the limits are V1 to V2. Therefore, the heat added per unit mass of this idle gas during process 1 to 2 is given by this. Similarly, if we look at the heat that is rejected by a unit mass of this gas and that is Q2, so to get this value of Q2, we'll apply the first law on this process going from 3 to the equilibrium state 4. So again, we have for this process 3 to 4, we have the first law u4 minus u3 is equal to the heat that is added during this process plus the work done per unit mass of the gas during this process. Again, we have this term to be zero because the temperature is constant and the internal energy of an idle gas depends only on the temperature. So minus Q34, so this is the heat that is being rejected and in our notation over here, this is equal to Q2 is equal to the work done on the system while taking the system from state 3 to state 4. Again, we have this integral P dV. This time the limits are from 3 to 4 and we have a negative sign over here. So again, substituting the value of pressure in terms of temperature and volume, we can solve this integral and you can show that this is equal to R T2 log V3 by V4. And note that this temperature is T2 and in this relation, this temperature is T1. So what we have found is that the heat that is rejected during the process 3 to 4 is equal to this. Now let's see that how this ratio V2 by V1 and V3 by V4 are related because later on we are going to look at the ratio of these two heats. So we want to first see if somehow these ratios V2 by V1 and V3 by V4 are related to each other. If we look at this ratio Q1 by Q2, then it would simplify. So to do so, what we consider is that we will now consider this process that is this reversible adiabatic process from 2 to 3. Now we can apply the first law to this process. So in the adiabatic process, let's say going from 2 to 3, dq is equal to 0. Therefore, du is equal to dw and cv dt is equal to minus pdv. And here we are not assuming cv to be constant. So for an idle gas, the specific heat capacity can be a function of temperature. So this is what we have and this is equal to, so pressure I can write as and we can take this temperature to the denominator on the left hand side and now integrate from state 2 to state 3. So what we'll get is we have minus r log 
B3 by V2 and note that at state 2 the temperature is T1 and at state 3 the temperature is T2. So therefore these limits are in fact T1 to T2. So this is one relation. Similarly, we can look at this process that is a reversible adiabatic process from state 4 to state 1. So for that process again we can write the same equation where the specific heat capacity is also a function of temperature and this time we integrate from state 4 to state 1. So at state 4 the temperature is T2 and at state 1 temperature is T1 and that is equal to minus R log V1 over V4. So now let's look at these two equations. So you can see this integral is negative of this integral over here because the limits are opposite. So what we can say is that R log V1 by V4 is equal to minus R log from here V3 by V2 that is equal to So from this equation, we get V1 by V4 is equal to V2 by V3. Or in other words, we can write V2 by V1 is equal to V3 by V4. These are exactly the ratios over here. So that means this term log of V2 by V1 is equal to this term log of V3 by V4. So now if we look at the ratio of heats Q1 over Q2 and that is equal to the ratio of heats per unit mass that we get as T1 over T2 for a Carnot cycle being performed by an idle gas. And note that in this derivation we have not assumed the gas to be a calorically perfect gas. If we had assumed we could have directly written these ratios to be equal because then we could simply write Tv raised to power gamma minus 1 is a constant. But even if the gas is not calorically perfect still these ratios of the specific volumes are the same. So now recall that earlier we have seen that this ratio is equal to the ratios of the absolute thermodynamic temperature and we have now seen that this ratio Q1 by Q2 that is equal to the ratio of the absolute thermodynamic temperature is also equal to the ratio of temperatures on the idle gas scale. Therefore, we conclude that the idle gas temperature scale and the absolute thermodynamic temperature scale are proportional and recall that we can choose the units of the thermodynamic scale because the thermodynamic scale is indeterminate up to a multiplicative constant and therefore we conclude that these two scales coincide. So the absolute thermodynamic scale phi is equal to the idle gas temperature scale. So because phi and this capital T are now equal from now we can use T to denote the absolute thermodynamic temperature. So to summarize we have shown that 
the fact that the efficiency of a reversible heat engine operating between same thermal reservoirs is independent of the working substance leads us to this absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature and thereafter we have shown that this absolute scale of temperature is identical or coincides with the idle gas temperature scale. Now using this absolute thermodynamic scale of temperature in the next lecture we are going to introduce a new property that is entropy.